Uh, thanks everyone for participating in the Web Warrior quiz. Can't wait to announce those here in just a couple of days. So next up, we've got an amazing presentation coming to you from Mr. Adam Silverstein. He is a developer relations engineer at Google. He's gonna be talking about maximizing WordPress speed, essential performance hacks, um, he has been making the open web better through open source contributions. He is a lifelong programmer, lover of languages, and these days he's mostly writing JavaScript. So Adam, I'm I'm pumped, man. I'm pumped for your talk. Welcome to the Cloudways Purposecon 2024 stage. Great. And, uh, it's all yours, man. Thanks for having me. All right. I'm super happy to be here. I think I've got some slides that are going to come up. There they are. Awesome. All right, so I'm going to jump in. I've got 45 minutes. Hopefully, I'll finish a little early and leave some time for Q&A at the end. I'm going to cover three areas uh, today, talk about what's new in Core Web Vitals for 2024. I'm going to talk about what we're working on in the WordPress core performance team. And then finally, because it is 2024, I'm going to talk about using AI to assist with performance tuning. And just a note that I'll have a link uh, to these slides at the end. So you'll see there's a lot of links throughout the slides. Uh, just don't worry about copying those down. You'll have access to the whole thing at the end. So Core Web Vitals. Um, hopefully everyone's familiar with Core Web Vitals. It's a pretty, uh, it's an initiative that's been around for a while. Uh, it is essentially an attempt to move beyond the kind of raw speed metrics that we used to measure everything by lifetime to first byte. Still a valuable metric but a way to look at a performance as how users experience your site uh, and, and essentially trying to move from just raw speed to actually what do users experience when they visit your site, when they try to interact with your site. And so that's where the three core web vitals come from. And they aim to measure three areas of user experience. Is the site loading? Uh, is it interactive when users try to click to open a, a calendar or add something to their cart? And is it stable? Are there things popping in and out and shifting around so that when you try to interact with the page, uh, you, you misclick and so forth, which can obviously be a frustrating experience. So we had these three core web vitals, LCP, FID, and CLS. And this year we got rid of FID, first input delay, and we replaced it with INP or interaction to next paint. So I'm gonna dig in a little bit more, but for all of these metrics, when we're talking about a good experience, we're aiming for uh, a good experience for 75% of our users. Users will have a variety of experiences depending on the conditions at the time that they access your site, their device, the network, and so forth. Uh, so what we're, what we're aiming for here is the 75th percentile, an important note. So what is interaction to next paint? This is a measure of all of the interactions that happen during the life cycle of a page clicking, tapping, and it measures all of those interactions and then reports on the worst ones, the slowest interactions that happen. So it helps you identify problem interactions that are happening on your site. So a good INP score is 200 milliseconds or less. Anything over 500 milliseconds is considered poor. And in between is everything in between is deemed needs improvement. So those are the sort of numbers that we're looking at aiming for. And again, this is for 75th percentile of users. And with IMP, we're focused primarily on mobile because desktop users tend to all have a good experience already. So you can focus your efforts for improving this metric on mobile users. So what does IMP capture? It captures these poor experiences that we've all had on the web where we click on something and it doesn't react and we click again and then suddenly it reacts twice. Uh, instead of these good user experiences where you click and it's very responsive instantly. And these poor experiences do impact business metrics, right? They affect user engagement, how likely users are to continue on the site or whether they'll add something to their cart or sign up for your newsletter, whatever your goals are. So this is the critical thing uh, to understand. And, and a key insight of INP is that users spend 90% of their time on your website after the page is loaded. So it's important to look at how they experience the site uh, even after the page is loaded. And why did we replace FID? Well, FID just wasn't doing a good job of capturing these poor experiences. We all know they're out there on the web. We've all had them, um, but F FID was, you know, all WordPress sites pretty much are passing FID. I think it's like 99% now pass it, 
Whereas when we look at INP, we see that WordPress ha sites have a little bit more trouble passing. We're now at about 80% pass rate, which isn't bad, but still some room to improve. So this means that the new metric is actually capturing more of the poor experiences that users are ha having. So I'm just gonna explain a little bit more about what exactly INP measures. Um, so first input delay measured this part, the initial delay between when the user clicked and when the event handlers began to fire for that click. INP measures the entire interaction. So everything from the click all the way till the user is presented with an update uh, so that they know that the browser is actually responding to their, to their input. Um, and INP also measures all the interactions, whereas first input delay only measured the first interaction that happened on the page. So the, the interaction is made up of these parts, the input delay, which is what we previously measured with first input delay between the click and the event handlers firing them. And there can be multiple event handlers here that are gonna fire. And this input delay can be long if the main thread is busy with other JavaScript tasks. Then we have the processing time of handling all of the event handlers. And this can be long if the event handlers are poorly written. A good event handler will yield back to the main thread early on uh, and allow the, the browser to continue to the presentation display so the user knows something's happening. Uh, a poor event handler will, will sort of hang the main thread. So there is a way to, to fix uh, processing time and that is yielding back to the main thread. And finally, uh, presentation delay. This is the amount of time it takes for the browser to actually display an update to the user. So you've clicked on something and, and you're gonna expand an area. If you have an overly complex DOM or a really uh, elaborate CSS tree, the browser has to figure out how to re-render everything. That can take some time, especially on a lower power device. There's all kinds of tools out there to measure INP. All of the, the tools that you may have used already for page speed uh, measurement are include INP data. There's also tools that are specific for collecting real user metrics uh, because this metric is something that only happens in the field with real users. It's di very difficult to measure in the lab because it requires uh, actual interactions. Once you figure out that you have a poor interaction somewhere on your site and you've figured out what where that interaction is, you can use lab testing to try to improve that. You can you know use browser throttling and dev tools and you can test like changes to see how they're how they're impacting your interaction. And you can you know work on it that way, but you really do want to see the improvements in the field. Um, so the basic process is similar to any uh, performance debugging. You're going to repeat, you know, make small changes, test to see if it fixes it and then repeat that, that process. There's some great articles that have been written this year. I've got links here on the page, so you'll get those at the end. Um, but in the interest of time, I'm going to move on to my next topic, which is the work of the WordPress core performance team. So I'm most of this work that I'm talking about, you can check out by downloading the Performance Lab plugin. This plugin is um, our sort of master plugin that enables all of the features that, that I'm gonna talk about that are also released as individual plugins. Um, so just install Performance Lab, and then you can enable each of the features that I talk about individually in there. It also includes some site health checks that uh, will tell you if you need to, for example, enable more modern image formats or various things that might be missing or set up wrong performance-wise on your site in, this, in the tools site health section of WordPress. So here are some of the things we're working on in the Performance Lab. Uh, one really cool thing is called speculative loading. This is a, a way of providing instant navigations once users reach your site. It leverages the new speculation rules API that's available in Chrome and Edge browsers so far. Uh, it is being proposed as a standard though, so hopefully we'll see this across browsers. And essentially with the, uh, with the API, we've, we've chosen to use the sort of conservative mode where as users hover over links, we pre-render those links in the background. Then if the user clicks on the link, the page will load instantly because it's already, it's it's like switching the tabs, essentially. The page is already there. Um, of course, on mobile, you don't have hover events. So you're, you're not actually starting the pre-render until the user taps. Um, but still, you might get a couple hundred milliseconds of a faster load time than uh, than if you wait till they release their finger, which is when, which is when typically navigation would start. Um, and you can also fine tune this. So if you know that you have a big blue button that people are very likely to click in the middle of your page, your call to action button, you can uh, add that to be pre-rendered automatically, even without a hover. 
Now there's a trade-off here when we're doing pre-rendering. Uh, we might, or we're very likely actually to pre-render pages that the user will never visit. So there is a cost associated with that. The trade-off is that the users who do visit the links that you've pre-rendered are going to get this instant, amazingly fast experience. The next plugin or feature that I want to talk about is Optimization Detective. And this is a really amazing effort to capture front-end uh, data to inform back-end rendering uh, with performance in mind. So what this plugin does is it has a little bit of JavaScript that runs on the front end, and it captures metrics about the page um, at different breakpoints. So it can, for example, record what the LCP element is at different breakpoints or what elements are in the viewport. And this is a critical capability. Without something like this, we simply don't have any information about the viewport on the back end. So for example, with lazy loading of images, WordPress tries to lazy load images that aren't in the initial viewport, but we're just making a guess in the back end. We don't actually know which image is gonna be an LCP image. We, we assume that if there's a large image early in the content, that's likely to be the one, but we don't know. So LCP element can be different on every uh, breakpoint. So here's wordpress.org looking at four different breakpoints. We see that four different elements are the LCP element. So by using this front end optimization detective, we can actually capture which element is the LCP element, record that into WordPress, and then the next time we render the page, we can use that to prioritize the images properly. Which brings us to the image prioritizer plugin. It leverages the optimization uh, detective data to prioritize images more accurately than WordPress core currently can. So it adds fetch priority high. It knows about the breakpoints, so it can it can properly add breakpoint loading. It can preload background images. And it will essentially give us much higher accuracy in terms of which image we prioritize with fetch priority high, and also which images we lazy load because we know they're not in the viewport. So this uh, is, in a way, a, a silver bullet, I guess, of LCP optimization because we actually know what the LCP element is, um, which we currently do not know in WordPress. So check this out. Uh, Embed Optimizer is another plugin that we've, we've been working on. This is specifically for uh, the embeds that you get. If you, you know, paste like a YouTube URL into the editor, you'll get this nice block. That's an, that's an embed. And those are now lazy loaded with this plugin, including the JavaScript that they enqueue, which can be quite heavy. And these embeds can be quite impactful on performance because if they're all loading while your page is loading, there's this contention for resources that's happening. Uh, so by lazy loading them, you just eliminate that problem. Um, it also leverages the optimization detective data. So it knows if you have optimization detective installed, it knows which elements are in the viewport. So it can be more accurate about what gets lazy loaded. If you have an embed that's in your initial viewport, you probably don't want to lazy load that. You, you want it to load with a normal or high priority if it's the LCP element. So that's what embed optimizer does. And Modern image formats is one I'm excited about. This plugin converts your uploaded images to a modern image format like AVIF if it's, if it's available or as a fallback WebP, which is available on about 99% of WordPress servers. AVIF is something like 30% of servers that run WordPress support it. Uh, with AVIF, you get a huge savings, almost 50%. And with WebP, it's more like 30% over JPEGs at the same quality. And if you're using PNGs for transparent images, Switching to these new formats is huge uh, savings in space. And the reason for that is PNGs, which are typically used for transparencies where you have a transparent background, they only use lossless compression. Whereas AVIF and WebP formats both support lossy compression with transparent backgrounds. So the plugin supports this natively. You can upload your PNGs and it will output AVIFs or WebP as the fallback uh, and you'll get a huge savings. We also have picture element support, and this is the best way to provide uh, format fallback. So browsers that don't support AVIF will fall back to the, the original format that you uploaded, the JPEG, for example. And, and that's by wrapping both of those formats in a single picture element that then the browsers can decide what the best image or what the image they can support inside that. So I covered the, the top projects and just a few Others that I'm going to briefly mention, we're working on client-side image processing in core. 
which is the ability to process images that you upload in the browser instead of relying on the server to do them, to do that processing. Uh, my colleague Pascal is going to give a talk about this uh, during the showcase day at, at WordCamp US. So check that out if you're there. But essentially, this allows us to use features like AVIF without having to upgrade the WordPress server or have people migrate to a new server to get that feature. We, we sort of leapfrog the limitations of the server capabilities by moving to the browser where we can run the same libraries using WebAssembly. We have the plugin check plugin, which is a project, a collaboration with the plugin check team, plugin review team, where we're trying to build out a tool so plugin authors can check their plugins, uh, including for performance tests. We've also been working on the interactivity API. If you haven't heard about it, it's a new API in WordPress for adding front end interactivity. It's very lean and we are trying to build performance into the API. Um, this is essentially something that could replace the use of jQuery, for example. Uh, and the final thing is our performance testing tools, the framework that we've built for performance in core. We have automated tests that run so we can see what's happening with each commit. We have uh, a whole bunch of tools that you can run, like CLI commands that you can run on your own. We also have automatic, uh, I mean, uh, GitHub actions that will you can integrate into your project to run performance tests. And all of these tools we're making available. The idea is that you know the community also needs to be paying more attention and have the tools they need to, to test performance and build performant plugins. And this brings me to the last section of my talk, uh, using AI to address performance issues. And a little uh, kind of warning here, this is all experimental. Um, and you know, take the advice that you get from LLMs with a grain of salt. You'll see that uh, there are some mistakes that they make. Um, so this is just something that I've been playing around with, and I wanted to share what I've been finding with everyone, and hopefully it will be useful. So the basic approach that I've been using is first to define uh, with system instructions a performance expert who's a helpful assistant that's going to analyze data for me and give me advice. Uh, then I gather all the data about the site that I want to analyze, including a PageSpeed Insights JSON object, maybe the HTML of the site, a list of plugins. The list goes on and on. You can really upload a huge amount of information. Um, next, I upload the, all that information to the LLM. And here you'll see that I've, I've tested with ChatGPT and Gemini, both of which under their paid accounts allow you to upload files. So you do that kind of first to start the process, and then you're asking it to analyze and correlate data. And also, you can ask it to drill down on specific problems and how to solve them. So let's see what that uh, looks like. First, uh, gathering the data with PageSpeed Insights API, you can literally just put this in your browser with your URL at the end, and then save the JSON object to your hard drive. And that's what you'll upload to the, the uh, chat or to the AI. And for getting your plugin details, I like this export plugin details plugin. Uh, it just gives you a CSV list of all your uh, plugins and versions and so forth. Uh, you can also upload the plugins themselves, although as far as I've tested, the, the uh, LLMs do not support zip files. So you'll need to upload like the whole folder of files if you want, if you want to include them. So here we go. I uh, started this session with ChatGPT. And it, the first thing I'm going to do is create a GPT. This is a model that has some specific instructions about being a helpful performance expert. And then I upload all of my files. And I ask it simply to tell me, what are the top three performance issues? And a little while later, uh, it takes it a little while. It analyzes all the data. And it comes back with this very succinct summary of what the top issues are. These are the top issues on the site that I was testing. So kudos, good job here. Um, but more importantly, it was able to take this huge amount of data. If you look at a PageSpeed uh, report, PageSpeed Insights report, you look at a Lighthouse report, you'll see there's a lot of information there to digest. And it can be overwhelming. And, and the LM has helped here by just summarizing the very top points. So now I'm going to continue and ask it what I should do to fix this problem. Uh, obviously, this slow server response time is a huge problem for me. And it recommends that I you know, maybe look at WooCommerce because it knows that's a heavy plugin. And it also notices that I have five form plugins enabled on this site, which is not a very good idea. And maybe I should disable some of those. Uh, so that's what I did. The next thing I did 
Uh, oh no, the next thing I did was ask it about scripts. So in this case, I'm asking it about like blocking scripts, which are the worst problems. And again, it's able to both tell me which script is causing the problem as well as which plugin is in queuing that script. So it's actually telling me um, which plugin is causing the problem, which is very helpful. This is something that can be very difficult to figure out when you're looking at performance uh, traces or a lighthouse report. You know, where is the problem coming from? The LLM does a good job of figuring this out. Next, I asked it for a fix. How do I fix this problem? It suggested lazy loading, the embed. That's a good idea. So I asked it for the code. That was the next step. I'm going to try out its fix. Unfortunately, here's where things went a little wonky. Um, so in the code snippet that it gave me, even though it's functional, it's using an outdated approach. Uh, it's using uh, JavaScript uh, to do the lazy loading. So it enqueues up this lazy sizes script. That's no longer required. Um, all the modern browsers support native iframe lazy loading. So all we need to do is add lo equals lazy to the iframe to lazy load it. So this is, although this is a, a technique that will work, it's actually outdated advice. And I think this brings up one of the challenges of using LLMs for performance advice. They're great for digesting huge amounts of data and connecting the dots between different data sets. However, sometimes they get things wrong. And as a novice user, you may not know when you get advice that isn't good advice. So a really nice improvement here would be references, right? A way to link out to something that shows uh, where this best practice comes from. In this case, this probably comes from some article that's, that's really out of date, the wrong answer. So there's definitely some room for improvement here. And I see this as a big challenge with using LLMs for performance. Uh, or really for any kind of thing, because you there's a you're sort of trusting it to be an expert, but at the same time, do you really trust it? Uh, one other thing I really liked with ChatGPT is after each response, it gave me these little chips uh, with suggested follow-up questions. So here it's suggesting any other ways to improve performance, and that's the whole idea here. It's a conversation you can keep asking questions and drilling down into problems that you're having. Next, I tried Gemini. So in this case, I created a gem. This is like a GPT. Uh, the gem is uh, the system instructions that I'm giving Gemini to act as uh, an expert. And one thing I liked here is that it actually exposes the, the, the full system instructions and lets me edit them. So I went in and I added some WordPress specific instructions, telling the LLM how to correlate the script paths that you find uh, in a Lighthouse report with the plugin paths by the slug. So this is a, a way to sort of inform the LLM how it should do the analysis on the data that it's about to get. Then I proceeded, I uploaded all the data, just like I did with ChatGPT, and it came back with the same sort of uh, response where it highlighted the top uh, issue as being the slow server response time. So very good there so far. And I, now I'm going to ask it for a solution. How can I fix this problem? What plugins could be causing my problems? Again, it picked up on the fact that I had five form plugins installed uh, and recommended that I, I deal with that situation. And so what I did then was I actually disabled all the plugins. Turns out I didn't need uh, form plugins. So I disabled all the form plugins. And I reran the Lighthouse report. And I asked it to compare to the previous report. So this is another really useful a feature of LLMs is you can take this huge data set and then get a new version and ask for a comparison. And that's exactly what uh, Gemini did. It gave me a before and after comparison, and it gave me this nice little chart at the bottom. I really like that it gives you the export to sheets button. This is super helpful to me because I can export this. Each step that I do in my performance tuning process, I'm going to save that data so I have a record of all of the changes that I've made along the way. And um, then I did some more optimizing. Uh, this time I optimized the main image on the page, which I had purposefully left oversized, and I made it the correct size so the dimensions matched the actual image. And I also changed it to being a WebP image, which is obviously smaller. And after I made those changes, I reran Lighthouse and I uploaded the file again and I asked it to compare. And again, I got this great chart and I made a huge impact here with this change. Uh, and the thing that I like most here is that it right after this, it told me um, that I've now fixed my LCP problem. You know, I've dramatically improved LCP. So it, it really 
uh, honed in on what the results of this change were, which is really helpful to a user to know that they've had the right impact that they're trying to make with the changes. So this is using LLMs to kind of analyze data, right? Uh, this is something that I do over and over again at the performance booth, uh, at the performance table at the Google booth at WordCamps is people come in and we look at their Lighthouse scores, maybe we do a dev trace, maybe we look at the list of their plugins, the HTML of their website, and then we try to synthesize all of that data into some concrete recommendations, some a few things that they can try to maybe improve their performance. And after doing that process over and over again, I realized this could be a good task for an LLM. And it gave me an idea, which is maybe I could build a plugin for this. So that's exactly what I did. Um, so this is my first time announcing this publicly. Uh, this is uh, public though on my repo. So you could go check it out on GitHub. It's the WP Performance Wizard. And essentially what this plugin does is all the things that I just showed you in the previous steps. So it has a set of system instructions that define it uh, as a helpful performance expert. Uh, I've built a connector to Gemini so far, but it's open source. So please someone build the ChatGPT connector. It's, it's uh, pretty simple to do. Uh, it collects data from a bunch of data sources. So far I've built in Lighthouse, HTML, and plugin and theme data. Uh, and then it, it proceeds with a sort of conversational mode where it sends each data set off to the um, off to the agent. And it also has some instructions for each data source about how to analyze that data. So things like, for example, how to correlate the plugins back to the Lighthouse data, that kind of thing. And then at the end, it becomes interactive. So you can ask the follow-up questions and drill down on the information that you want. And this is how it looks. So uh, you go into WordPress, Tools, Performance Wizard, and you click Start Analysis, and it's going to start this conversation. Now, I've sped up this video. This actually takes several minutes to complete because each time you hit the LLM, there's quite a bit of time for it to analyze all that data and get back to you. Uh, and also things like Lighthouse API, take this, uh, PageSpeed Insights API takes quite a while. But anyway, this is the speeded up response here. At the very end, you get this nice summary of what the top recommendations are. It also includes testing instructions and so forth. Um, this is kind of what some of the results look like. And you can see, again, that it's doing this great job of correlating the problems to the plugins, as well as to the specific Lighthouse audits that they found. Again, I've, I've talked about this a little bit, but it does a great job with attribution. It detects duplicate plugins. It comes up with a testing strategy, so how you can test the fixes and see if they're actually having the impact that you want. But uh, And it also identifies specific problems, so I created a plugin that enqueues seven different JavaScript libraries, and it clearly identified that is the problem you're having. But it also sometimes gets it completely wrong, like in one case where it recommended that I increase my LCP from 1.1 to the recommended 2.5 seconds. That's exactly the opposite of good advice. The actual recommendation is to say below 2.5 seconds. So uh, please contribute. Uh, like I said, it's open source. I have a lot of ideas for how this uh, plugin could be improved and made more useful made more accurate. Uh, I have issues open for these, most of these ideas already on the repo. And that is my talk. Thank you very much. Uh, the bit.ly address is the slides. The QR code uh, that is on your screen is a quick survey for you. If you have a moment just to answer uh, the question, did you learn anything from this talk about performance in 2024? And I think I finished with a little bit of time left over for any questions that might have come up in Q&A. Adam, love it, love it. Lots of kudos for you in the chat. Uh, let's give a nice round of thank you for Adam's amazing talk on essential performance hacks for WordPress speed. We're gonna now go to some time for questions. So if you want to make sure you mark that in the Q&A panel, we'll be working through those questions that folks asked um, through the Q&A. So I'll be looking at that and jumping back and forth to chat. Um, we'll start off here with this question from Om um, Prakash. What are the techniques um, effective for detecting and optimizing performance bottlenecks in web applications? I just pinned that up to the screen there for you, Adam. So I, I assume that is more about like when you say web applications as opposed to like a website, maybe. Um, I guess I'm gonna say the most important thing is collecting data, real user metrics. Um, that's something where 
uh, it can really inform how how users are are experiencing your your website or application. A lot of times we we tend to test things out on our high powered development computers. That's called lab testing. Uh, when when sites get live or applications get live in the field, uh, users have a very different experience. They might not have the same high powered devices. They might be on iffy uh, network connections. So I would say the first thing would be collect data. Uh, and then and then it's similar to any type of performance tuning where you identify where the worst problems are, you try to fix those problems, and then you uh, repeat, you, you test to see if, if that made the impact that you want and, and uh, repeat that process over and over again until you've fixed your problems. Here's another one for you from David, how to optimize YouTube video embeddings. That's a great question. Um, we do have the embed optimizer that aims to do that. We have an issue there to possibly replace YouTube embeds with the YouTube Lite embed that uh, was developed by Paul Irish. You can just search YouTube Lite, you'll find that. You can use that as a substitute. One really big challenge with any way of substituting, uh, optimizing the YouTube embeds is that on, I think it's Safari Mobile, um, when, you, when you do that type of uh, lazy loading of the embed, it takes two clicks to start the video, not one click. I'm, I'm, I'm not explaining it exactly right, but there is a fundamental technical problem um, that even things like the YouTube Light Embed has where you don't get that, that one play click that users are expecting. Um, but I would say that if you if the optimization is the most important thing to you, I would, I would definitely check out that YouTube Light uh, and also the Embed Optimizer plugin. Very cool, awesome recommendations. Uh, let's jump to this one here from Stasha. I'll go ahead and pin this one on the screen there. If I choose to use an external host for my images, do I need to convert them from JPEG to WEBP format before uploading them to that host? Yeah, I think that depends on, on where you're talking about hosting the images. Um, with image CDN services, they typically will do that type of conversion automatically. Um, so if you're using an image CDN where your images get uploaded automatically, then when they get served up to users, they'll typically get served up in the best possible format. So the browsers actually announce which formats they support as part of their request. And then the CDN can respond with either AVIF or WebP, depending on what, what they support. Uh, if, if you're talking about like uploading your files to S3 directly and then serving them from there or something like that, then yes, you would need to convert those because WordPress will only do this conversion um, when you are uploading your images directly to WordPress. Cruising through our questions here, Adam. There's some good stuff in here. Just want to get as many as Great. we can in the time we have. This one's coming in from Lindsay, uh, still on the image topic. Does using modern image formats help at all with other people stealing image photography <laughs> from my website? That's a great question, actually. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, we tried to land WebP by support in, in WordPress core. And what this would have done is essentially what the plugin that we have now does. So when you uploaded your JPEGs, it would have automatically converted them to WebPs for serving on the front end. And then when end users visited your site, uh, it would have been WebP images. Now, one of the problems with that and the reason we didn't wind up landing that feature is that if users download those WebP images, they're less useful in other places that aren't the web. So for example, Google Docs does not support WebP images. Um, if you switch to AVIF images, you'll find even fewer places that you can use them because it's a newer format. So in a way, switching to modern formats does help you with people stealing your images because they become a little harder for people to use. Uh, they can still download them, but now they're in the AVIF format. They need to know how to convert that to JPEG. Probably not a huge help, but it is interesting that for things like publishers, for example, where they really don't want people just copying images off their website, the sort of problem that we have with landing WebP is, is actually a benefit to them. So it helps a little bit, I guess, would be my answer there. Going back in chat a little bit to some previous questions that were asked here. Uh, do INP captures always indicate direct engagements? Um, they are their user interaction. So I think you're asking like, is it a direct interaction? Yes, that's the answer is yes. That's what it captures. Cool. And then let's see here. We probably have time for a few more questions still. Um, what advantages does the uh, high efficiency image format have over traditional formats like JPEG? 
Aha. So HEIF or HEIC uh, is another sort of very similar format. Or I think HEIC is the one that's the uh, default output format for iPhones. So you may have come across this image format if you've looked at photos that you've synced to your computer that you took with an iPhone. If you upload them directly from your iPhone, Apple actually converts them to JPEGs. Um, but these, this format, HEIF or HEIC, they're closely related. So I'm going to talk about HEIC because I know more about it, is not widely supported on the web. So it's supported in Safari, but no other browsers support it. So it's not really a web safe image format. But we did recently land in WordPress core a feature where if you upload these HEIC images, instead of giving you an error, if the server actually supports HEIC, we'll convert those for you automatically to JPEG. Um, so the advantage, I guess, is uh, there probably are some more technical advantages, but it has, you know, high dynamic color range, much better compression than JPEG. Uh, it probably has some other features that are lacking from JPEG that I'm, I'm forgetting now, but the challenge is that it's not really a web format. Um, and so you can't really directly use it on your website unless you only have Safari visitors. This question's from earlier on WP Rocket, whether WP Rocket has all of these plugins maybe that were mentioned earlier. Uh, WP Rocket has features that are similar to all of these features that I announced. They don't use our plugins, obviously. Um, we do work closely with several of the optimization plugins, including WP Rocket. Uh, we welcome their contributions because they know a lot about optimization. But uh, yeah, they have similar features. They have uh, that we have in our plugin. So if you're already using WP Rocket, you probably have most of these features already. Um, they're not doing things exactly the same way that we do them. So you might get slightly different results, but in terms of the, the general approach, like optimization detective, they definitely are doing something like that where they're capturing metrics and using that to inform how they do the loading. Um, yep. Uh, what metrics are most essential? I know you talked quite a bit about a lot of these. I'm not sure how much time we have for that question, yeah. but I mean, um, you know, it's uh, the them. ones that you're failing on are the ones that are most <laughs> essential for you. And, and that's the whole point of these metrics really is to help you capture uh, data about poor experiences that users are having so that you can fix them. That's really what these metrics are for. So it's going to vary tremendously depending on your site, depending on where your users are. Uh, you might have a lot of large images that might be, you know, you might need to pay to LCP might be your main thing. You might have a very interactive site where IMP is the most important thing. So it, it really depends. There isn't one answer to that other than to say the core web vitals are the top, top ones to pay attention to. Um, I will say that uh, it kind of came up in my in my AI section that time to first byte is a is a large problem in WordPress. We have a lot of sites with a slow time to first byte. If you can't get your time to first byte down to a reasonable level, you know your LCP is never going to be good. Um, you're never going to get good performance if you can't get your time to first byte down. So that's usually solvable with something like full page caching. However, if you're doing something like e-commerce, that may not be a valid solution for you. So again, it really varies tremendously depending on what your needs are, what your site is. I'm going to take a little bit of a of a detour here on some of your core presentation, Adam. But I'd love to get your insight as a person at Google. If you want to answer this question, he is Shaw is new in the IT field. Can you guide him on where you could apl apply for some basic level jobs or any career advice uh, do you have for people that are early in their kind of IT web pro career? Yeah, I've I've done some mentoring with with kind of people early in their career, so I know how challenging it is. I think it's a super challenging thing to get involved in IT. Um, any kind of job, you know, when you're when you're applying, you sort of have to sell yourself. So it's really easy to try to tout up what you can do and then feel feel like you're lying about it. You know, the uh, imposter syndrome, as they call it. I would say for me personally, that's all I can really share is my own personal experience. One of the biggest things was getting involved in open source. Uh, early on, I applied for a job at Automatic and I was denied because I wasn't WordPressy enough. And that led me to uh, releasing a plugin and eventually getting involved in WordPress core and eventually becoming a core committer, uh, which I've been doing now for you know over a decade. So that work that I did in open source in WordPress core was essentially my resume when I went to get my my real job essentially out there in the in the uh, industry was I could point to all this work that I had done in WordPress core, I could point to the commits, I could point to the things that I landed. I think anything that you can get involved in, whether it's WordPress or some other open source project where you can, and I was donating my time, I should say, uh, but you get the experience of working with other people, of, of building code, 
of interacting, which is a critical part of being successful in tech. Uh, so I would say get involved in open source, get involved in WordPress core. And Adam, I love from that advice, just the like taking the rejection of uh, an opportunity and actually using that as feedback of like, okay, if I went and did this other stuff, maybe that would help you. Obviously, it helped you immensely in your career. Yep. Um, maybe we have time for one more question here. We're going to go from Dimitri. Uh, if we made change to optimize Core Web Vital, why we can't see changes when we use the online Google PageSpeed tool? Um, okay, so there's a couple things here. Um, one is that, so there's there's two data sets that are returned. If, you, if you're talking about PageSpeed Insights, there's two data sets that are returned. If you have field data, that is how users are actually experiencing your site in the field, that shows up first. The second section is the lab data. That is run directly against your site when you, when you hit, hit the API or, or load the page. So that one should change when you make changes. Uh, I will say there's a lot of variability in those tests. So if you run them repeatedly, you'll get different numbers each time. Um, so if the changes are small, it may be difficult to, to pick up those those types of uh, changes. You could try our tooling, the uh, tools that we've developed, like the, the WPCLI commands that we have. One of the ways that we overcome that problem is that we run the tests repeatedly, like uh, 50 times or 100 times, and we take the median value. Um, so you should be able to see, sense differences when you make changes with those types of tools. Um, for field data, for data for how users are experiencing your site, that is delayed. So if you make the change now, it won't appear into you know next month's data set. Uh, so there's that factor as well. That is awesome. And that is all the time we have for questions, Adam. Uh, one last question here from the Cloudways team. How was your overall experience this year at the Cloudways Prepathon 2024? Great. Great. I caught a couple of the talks earlier and uh, it was fun for me to prepare for this. I haven't really talked about AI and performance yet publicly and even though I've been messing around with it a lot. So it was really fun to actually just prepare for it. And uh, yeah, I really enjoyed it. Thanks so much for having me. Awesome. Well, Adam, thank you. Let's give another virtual round of applause, some shout outs in chat. Uh, you know, our speakers are suckers for those emojis and memes and all that good stuff. So let's give Adam some love here at Cloudways Prepathon. So seeing lots of thank yous, awesome talks, all that good stuff. Adam, thank you so much for stopping by the Prepathon Thanks this year. Thanks for having year. me. Next up, uh, and stick with us, we've got um, one more session coming to you with our host, Shelly Fagan. Uh, she is going to be hosting a panel, a roundtable on UI UX mistakes to avoid for your client's website. So if you're building websites, if you're launching web apps for your clients, these are going to be UI UX mistakes. We've got some top experts coming in to join on this panel. So we're not quite yet done with day one of Cloudways Prepathon 2024. So stick with us and we will be right back.